And the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now, now Jesus came down with the twelve and, and stood on a stretch of level ground with great crowds of his disciples and a large number of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. And raising his eyes toward his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are now hungry, you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who are now weeping, you will laugh. Oh, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude and insult you and they denounce your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice, leap for joy on that day. Behold, your reward will be great in heaven. For their ancestors treated the prophets in the same way. But, but, but woe, woe to you who are rich for you have already received your consolation. Woe to you who are now filled, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will grieve and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for their ancestors treated the false prophets in just the same way. Gospel of the Lord. Amen. You, you know that you are beginning to mature when you come to the realization that life is not either or, but both and. And today we've got Jeremiah and Jesus both giving us both ands, both, both blessings and woes, and woes and blessings. Uh, Jeremiah begins the dance with the woes. And, and he goes further than that. He says, cursed. Oh, cursed is, is, is the one who puts their trust in human beings. That's a, a really hard and heavy statement. Uh, but he can say it and he does say it because, well, if we put our ultimate trust in one another because of our own fallibility, because of the, the flaw that is in us somewhere from the very beginning, sooner or later we're going to be let down. Sooner or later, we're going to be disappointed. Sooner or later, we're going to be hurt. So if we put our ultimate trust, and of course, the ultimate trust comes from the heart. He says, how sad the one whose heart is away from God. The heart of the matter is, is that organizing principle around which everything else flows. It's the, it's the profound depth of who we are in the depths of our heart, we say. So if our heart is put in things that are transient, the things that are relative, the things that are passing away, we're always going to be hurt. We're always going to be disappointed. He talks about the barren bush in the desert. The seasons don't change and everything is, oh, oh, whoa, oh, whoa. Then he contrasts that. And he says, how blessed is the one who is rooted, who is rooted in the depth. He's like... And she's like a tree that is planted besides the waters. Because what's going to happen? The sun is going to scorch. The drought is going to come. The leaves are going to uh, turn, but they're not going to die because why? They're being fed. The one who, whose heart is in the Lord, come what may, is going to be okay. And, and, and the come what may is the important part. Because if we are rooted in God, that is not a signal that all will be well. I don't know where we, we, we got the idea, but that if we, if we take two or three God pills every morning, our life will unfold perfectly. It will not. It is not the law of the universe. There still will be famine. There still will be hunger. There still would be nakedness. There still would be the sword. There still will be conflicts. There still will be war. And yet, in the midst of that, if we are rooted, we will be fine. You see, this, is, this really is the, the nature uh, of the universe. 
Uh, right from the very beginning, things come together, things fall apart. New things then come out of that. It becomes much more diverse, much more complex. But each time that something comes and is growth and born, it has to be born out of something that has died, something that had to let go, something that is no more, something that is extinct. And so that's the, the universal pattern. And, and we do ourselves a great injustice if we think that we are exempt from that pattern or that we can somehow transcend that universal pattern. We live under the illusion, and I really think it is an illusion, that we can, we can fix anything, we can conquer anything, if we just try hard enough and then get rid of the contaminating element. Now, whether that contaminating element is a, a, a crown-shaped virus, or the contaminating element is somebody of a different color or a different race, or the contaminating element is somebody from a foreign country, or the contaminating element, whatever it may be, if we could just get rid of it, all will be well. Hitler was, cons was absolutely convinced that Deutschland would be uber alles once we got rid of the perfidious Jews. Once they were out of the picture, oh, well, the kingdom will have come. Paradise would be here the Aryan race would conquer. That is an utter illusion. And, and we're given to that. We, we fall into that trap because, well, I think because there's something really good in us. There, there's something in, in us that really wants to try to excel, to get in control, to fix whatever the problem may be. I think that's, that, that there's something in us that wants us to always to grow and do better. But I think as we try to grow and do better, we always have to realize that if we get rid of one contaminating element, another one's going to come. We're never going to get rid of it all. It's part of the nature of life. And, and somewhere along the line, we need to, to realize that. That's part of the maturity to realize that life is not either or. That life really is both and. I, it, it seems to be a disappointment because we, we really do think that we want to conquer. And I think we need to try. It's amazing what happened these last two years by the efforts of those who, who tried to eradicate the virus once and for all. And we were almost there. On the 4th of July, the church was packed and the president got up and he said, It's over! Well, we know better, don't we? It's not over. It's still going on. And in that which we thought was only going to be a pandemic and something passing, now it looks like it's going to be an endemic and be with us for quite some time. Why? That's kind of the nature of reality. It's kind of the way things are. That doesn't mean, and, and, and hear me clearly, that we shouldn't try. We, we really do need to try. We really need to, to, to get into the fray of, of where the world is falling apart, where there is injustice, where work must be done. We need to do it. But we also need to realize that in our efforts, there is always a seed of destruction. And, it not is, and, and we cannot do it once and for all. In 1918, we we fought the world, the war, to end all wars. And we know how that turned out. In the 1920s, we prohibited liquor because, oh, fathers were drinking themselves to death. And, and we know how that turned out as well. The crime spree went crazy. And it didn't work. In the 1980s, we, we declared a war on drugs. You know, we were going to get rid of them once and for all. And what we did was create an, an industry of drug enforcement that became almost as corrupt as the drugs themselves. And the problems with opioids and fentanyl today is probably worse than it was when we began the war. It's still with us. In the 90s, it was the war on crime. If we could just get rid of the contaminating elements, so what did we do? We, we locked them up. 
and created a whole new industry of private prisons where we would, where we would and this is true, uh, slap people who sniffed cocaine on the wrist because they were white and incarcerated people who smoked crack because they were of a different shade. So we're still fighting the fight. Does that mean we don't fight the fight? Hear me again. Absolutely not. Because we are making progress. Things are better. It's hard for us to see it from our vantage point, but, but many things are, are so much better. There is a lot less hunger in the world. I just got a, a letter from Oxfarm this last week, one of the begging letters, and it says, please don't believe the lie that people are starving to death all the time. Things are better. We are making progress. J just J Jimmy Carter alone did all but almost single-handedly with his entire Carter group eliminated the, the guinea worm throughout the, the world, which has just devastated just millions. And it looks like we may be getting, getting a handle on malaria. So, yeah, we, we keep on trying, but in the midst of the trying, we need to realize that, that it's very paradoxical. And that with our great blessings, there are going to be woes. And somehow, we have to believe that's part of the deal. That's part of the plan. And that brings us today to, to Jesus' incredible paradoxical, well, this is the Sermon on the Plain. It's not the Sermon on the, it's not Matthew's version. You know, Luke's version in some ways is much tougher. He, and I think Matthew's preaching to a little more of a middle-class crowd, so he's softening things. Luke's not softening them at all. He, he comes out with, with, with absolute statements. Uh, and, and by the way, both of, both of these uh, sermons on the mountain, the Sermon on the Plain, you are never going to hear from a prosperity preacher coming out of his mouth because they don't know what to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Most of us don't know what to do. You're, you're going to find the Ten Commandments carved on the courthouses of many, uh, many, m many cities. You're never going to find the Sermon on the Mount carved on them. They don't know what to do with this. The, the Joel Olstein will never preach on the Sermon on the Mount. It's not gonna, it can't come out of his mouth. Because there's a straight line. You do this and God will reward you for that. And if you want to do well, you just follow these couple simple rules and God will bless you because you are special in the eyes of God. Well, you are special in the eyes of God. But it rains on the just and on the unjust. That's part of the deal. And so Jesus says these outrageous statements. And they are. Blessed are the poor, period. No poor in spirit, blessed are the poor. You know, I was the pastor of, a, of the poorest parish in the Diocese of Joliet, probably in the state of Illinois, for six years. And there's nothing pretty about poverty. And there's nothing pretty about being forced to choose between food and fuel. It, it, it does not look like a blessing, it looks like a curse. And yet the curse is the ones who feel that they are completely self-sufficient, that they are the self-made man, the self-made woman who trusts in their bank account, who trusts in their security, who trusts in their 401k and their Roth IRA. Those are the ones who, in a way, are cursed. And the poor are blessed. If you want to celebrate some Sunday morning, Celebrate in a rural, poor, black parish because everything that they receive now is gift. They are utterly dependent upon God, so everything that comes, comes from God. I've told you before that my favorite prayer comes out of our little prayer circles when we would gather together at the resale shop every Monday morning and I, prayer goes like this, I thank God that I woke me up, that he woke me up in my right mind this morning. That's a gift. That's a gift. And the poor see it. The poor know it. The poor are able to receive it like we who are rich, oh, woe to you rich, because sooner or later your riches are going to fail you. You fool, you will die tonight. To whom will your piled up riches go? And if you trusted in them, 
you're going to be sorely disappointed. Oh, blessed are you who, who hunger, for you will be satisfied. Well, we're all hungry, but most of us, our God is our belly. And so we will do whatever we can to fill our belly because we feel so empty. And I don't care how many Snickers you eat, they will never ultimately satisfy. They can't. They can't. How much porn you watch, how, how, much, how, much, how much of anything that you consume to yourself to try to fill you up, it will never fill you up. You will always remain empty. Woe to you who think you are filled. You're not. You're not. Oh, blessed are those who weep and mourn and know the sorrow of life. Because we will never know joy without sorrow. We will never know good without facing. We will never know light without facing the darkness, good without facing the evil. It's, it seems to be part of the woven fabric of the life we are called to live. What does that mean? Are we to stop proclaiming the kingdom? By no means. We proclaim the kingdom of God. We fight for righteousness and justice throughout the world. We scream and rail against the tyrants of the world today. But we come to the deepest realization that as Walter Brueggemann so beautifully put it, when you read biblical passages and choose to live a biblical life, you will understand that it is a, a world in travail. And that's not going to go away. That's part of the deal, the warp and the roof and the fabric of the life that we are called to live. Uh, two steps forward, one step back. Three steps forward, two steps back. And when we are in the middle of the back step, it is then that we are not to lose hope that we are going to come through this. Why? Why? We're rooted. We're rooted. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. We're rooted. We're going to be just fine. This is, a, this is called Christian realism. What that simply means is that, oh yeah, we do fight the good fight, we do proclaim the kingdom, but we do know that part of the process is going backward. But the goal is always, always, always to go to the omega point to go to the kingdom, to go to the, to the one in whom we are rooted, to go to God.